Today's, in today's lecture, we will discuss the fourth Ariyasatya, which has the rather long name of Dukkha Nirota Kamini Patipata, the practice, the way of practice leading to the quenching of Dukkha. But we, it also has a, a short name, which is Maga, meaning the path. And let us review just a bit the framework of, of everything we're discussing. We're looking into the human problem, into dukkha, and we've discussed what it is, where it comes from, and its purpose. Or, and now we talk about the method or the way to realize that purpose. <clears throat> so we've discussed dukkha itself, how, how dukkha is the problem, or we could say dukkha is the summation or includes all things that we would call problems. Dukkha is everything that is undesirable or unsatisfactory in our lives. Everything that dissatisfies us, this all is included under Dukkha. And then this, all this Dukkha arises due to causes, specifically due to attachment regarding the five khandhas. <clears throat> In short, we usually just say that dukkha is caused by, is caused by craving, but craving leads to the attachment in the five khandhas. And then removing, removing that attachment out from the five khandhas, this is the, the end of dukkha, the quenching of dukkha. And then we come to the fourth Ariyasatya, the way of practice, the way of living that removes attachment from the five khandhas. This is what we should look at today. In Pali, we have a word called patipata, patipata. This word has two meanings. The, the ordinary common meaning that used, was used by ordinary people at that time, patipata meant to walk, meant walking. But then in a spiritual context, it has another meaning. And so at the monastery, <coughs> patipata means to practice or to observe, to practice to observe the spiritual way or it can be similar to the word commitment that is used in some, some religious traditions. So patipata can mean both walking and mean practice and commitment to the spiritual, spiritual life. And then gamini means in, an instrument leading to it's the mechanism instrument that leads to. And so, Dukkha Nirota Kamini Patipata is the Patipata that leads to the quenching of Dukkha. And so then, all together, we call it Dukkha Nirota Kamini Patipata, the way of practice 
an, observa an observance which is an instrument leading to the, the total quenching of dukkha. This is a truth. This is the fourth of the four Ariya Satcha. <coughs> so now that we've come to this fourth noble truth, we should take we should take a look at the word truth a bit. We've been using it all along. Each each of these has its its special truth. The word truth is a special word in itself. And so now we have we see that dukkha, the existence of dukkha, has its its truth. And then the the origination, the source of that dukkha, has its truth. And the quenching, the cooling of that dukkha, has its truth. And then the way of practice that quenches dukkha also has its truth. Each of these, each of these has a reality and a truth to them, whether whether in a positive or a negative way, <clears throat> there is a truth in each of these. In everything, there, there is a truth. Everything has its truth. So, in negative, in negative things, there is the truth of that negativeness and in positive things there is the truth of that positiveness in in a lie in somebody in a lie there is the truth of that lie in any kind of deception or trickery there is a certain kind of truth there is the truth of that thing so everything has its truth within it and it's necessary for us to realize that truth, to, to get to it, to discover and realize it. And we do this by means of what we call batipata, through practice. Through practice we must get to the truth of these things. We should, we must be, we must try hard to understand the meaning of this word truth. In everything there is its truth. In a lie, in, in that, in dishonesty, there is the truth of dishonesty. That, that, that dishonesty has a truth to it in any kind of deception or any kind of fakeness or delusion or whatever, there is the truth of, of that thing. <clears throat> in, in the, in dukkha, dukkha which is a negative thing, has its truth. And then the quenching of dukkha, which is a positive thing, it too has its truth. We have our truths which are beneficial and our truths which have no benefit at all. Actually, truth itself is neither positive nor negative. The beneficial truths are positive, the, the ones that have no benefit seem negative. But in fact, real truth is neither positive nor negative. But this is just how we experience them. They seem positive, they seem beneficial or not to us. And so we have certain truths which seem to be of great benefit to us, especially these Four Noble Truths, because they are the truths that 
help us to get free of of all enemies, of all dukkha. And so it's important to to be interested in the beneficial truths. There are all these other truths which don't really have any any benefit. There are all kinds of facts and truths which we can interest ourselves in that don't really do us much good. So it's important to, to put our interest in these, the most beneficial truths. But often it's, it's much more fun to be interested in the, the worthless truths, the truths that don't really help us. And it, we often find the, the beneficial truths to not be very enjoyable. And another, another way of looking at this is whether it's attractive to the ear or not attractive to the ear. For many people to hear about the, hear about removing attachment from the five khandas, this is not a very attractive thing to listen to. For the most part, people aren't aren't interested in listening, so they don't pay any attention. For one to find this attractive, one must be able to understand, one must be able to see the benefit in it, the value of it. In this way, it's, it's something one finds it worth listening to words about the removal of attachment from the five khandas. So if, if one doesn't listen correctly, if one hasn't heard what is really being said, then one, under, one takes it to be pessimistic. People often think that removing attachment from the five khandas is pessimistic because they haven't really understood. But if one is able to listen properly and one understands the meaning of what is said, then it is optimistic to remove all attachment from the five khandas is something optimistic. So this is how things can deceive you all by the way it sounds or the way we first take things can be quite deceiving. When, when the listener is unable to hear, unable to understand, then they, they say that what this guy is saying, it, it doesn't make any sense. It has no value. It's meaningless, pointless. They say, this guy must be crazy, just speaking a lot of worthless, unintelligible things. But in fact, it's not the speaker, it's, it's the listener. The listener who doesn't know how to listen and is unable to understand. So we should consider carefully, is the speaker stupid? Or is it the listener who is stupid? <clears throat> so it all depends on whether the listener knows how to listen and is able to understand. If they don't understand, then they'll always, they'll always take it that the speaker is stupid, doesn't know what he's talking about, is babbling crazy things. When in reality it's the listener who is foolish, who is who doesn't understand. It's it's their own their own doing that they don't understand. And so hearing that one should remove self from the five khandas, they think this is of no value whatsoever, that it doesn't make sense. And so they they accuse the speaker of of being stupid. So we should be very careful to, we should look carefully and we should avoid 
avoid thinking that the speaker is stupid and doesn't know what he or she is talking about. And we should prepare, we should prepare ourselves so that we are able to listen, to listen and understand and benefit from whatever is being said. If we just assume that the speaker is stupid, we get no value from it. So we should be ready to listen and understand. If they don't understand what is being said, people will think that removing attachment from the five khandas means to kill oneself. And they're not going to like that. And so, of course, they think the speaker is stupid. Even university students and university professors are coming to ask <coughs> if, if there's no I and no mind, no self, no soul, no ego, nothing belonging to ego, then how can we live? These supposedly highly educated people can't, can't understand this. They must understand that it's possible to live without upadana, that there's no need for upadana in life. One should, should understand that there's something neutral. We could call it individuality, which is neutral. But then there can be the individuality that is attached to and the individuality that is not attached to. And these are drastically different. Individuality itself is just something that exists. But then if there's, if it's attached to, it's a completely different thing. And so we can say that there is, there is the self that is taken to be, there is, there is self that is taken to be the self. And then there is self which is take which is understood to be not self. There's just something real. There's just a reality. And then it's whether we take it to be self, the self, ego, or or not. This is what we must understand that that this this attachment is added later by us. It really has nothing to do with, with life, with reality. It's not necessary. So we can have a life, we can live with this sense of, of selfhood, the sense, the awareness that there is a self. Or we can live without that, live without a sense of self. Which of these is better? Which of these is to live free, free of dukkha? So this is the Machimabhatipata, the, the middle way of practice, the way of practice leading to the quenching of dukkha, the way of, of practice in life which leads to the end of, of the self. One no longer has the, the concept of self, the belief in an individual separate identity. However, one still, the mouth still, still speaks the word self, self, self. Because in the world this is the way we speak. In language, there are, there is still all the words about self. So the mouth uses these words, but there is no concept of self within the mind. And so we, we come to see if we understand this truth, if we understand this truth that there is not really any self, then there is no dukkha. 
all dukkha ends because there is nothing, there is no self to be the locus, to, to be the, the center and to experience that, to cause that dukkha. And so this is why in Buddhism <clears throat> we, we always talk about that there is not anywhere any self. And this allows us to be, to be free of the concept of self, which is the source of all dukkha. However, there are many, many creeds and religions that teach the existence of an, <coughs> of an eternal self. Vedanta, for example, teaches that there is a self, and there always, always will be. If we're not careful here, then we, this, is a, this could become a point of dispute. We could end up arguing about it. So we must be careful. We should try to understand that the self, the self of certain religions, or the soul, or the Atman, whatever it's called, that it's a self which is not self. And so it's, there's no problem talking about the self, but we should understand that that self is not really self. Or we can say, we should, we should understand the we, which is not we. The I, which is not I. Can, can you understand these words, the, the we, which is not we. If we can understand this way, then there's, there's no need for conflict. Those who talk about a self can continue doing so. If we can understand that that self is not, not a self. And so if that, that way of speaking, that approach works for them, if it, if it gets rid of all dukkha, well then fine. But it's, in Buddhism, we just, we emphasize, we don't talk about the self at all in that way. We just say that it is not self. So in the, the mind experiences that there is not self. However, the mouth speaks that there is self. But this isn't, this isn't, this isn't a lie. This isn't dishonesty. And so, <clears throat> to help understand this point, let us interject a little bit that as for views, as for human viewpoints on the self, there are basically three. One viewpoint says that there, there's a self, there always is a self. It's, there's a complete eternal self. This is called anat, or this is called atta. And then there's another view that there is nothing. There's nothing anywhere that can be, has anything to do with self. This is called nirata. And then in the middle, there is the Buddhist view, which is, there is a self, which is not self. There is self, which is not self. And we call this anatta, anatta, not self. There is the not self, anatta. This is the Buddhist understanding. And so in simpler terms, on this side is full of self, <clears throat> full of self. And over here is completely without self. And then in the middle, the self which is not self. So we come to the very important question. How are we going to have this kind of experience? What are we going to do in order to come to this realization? Can, can we have a direct experience of this through philosophy? Or is it necessary to really practice it in the heart? 
for there to be realization? This is an important question. Can, can we come to this experience merely by intellectual conclusions? Or does it take something more, a direct activity within the heart in order to realize that? Buddhism cannot accept that this experience can be arrived at merely by reasoning. The conclusions that come from, re from thinking and reasoning, these conclusions, Buddhism cannot accept that they are true realization. In Buddhism, the only realization means a direct inner experience having actually, actually removed anta, self, from the five khandhas, when that is directly experienced through having done it. This, this is what Buddhism means by, by realization. So we should see very, very clearly, even absolutely, that in vipassana or in mental cultivation, meditation, there is no reasoning. Vipassana is not reasoning. Mental development, meditation is not, is not reasoning. But vipassana and jita bhavana are above reasoning. And so this anapanasati, or vipassana, is, is above reasoning. If it was just reasoning, it would only be philosophy, but it's, it's, above, it's above reasoning. So to help us distinguish this point and not confuse things so they get all, all mixed together and messed up, we can discriminate, we can distinguish three levels of, of knowledge, of understanding. The first level is that of, of books, of third-hand knowledge we get from books or listening to others speak. This is the lowest level of knowledge. Then the second level is that of, of reasoning, taking that information we've gotten from others and thinking about it. But then the, the third level of, of knowledge, of wisdom, is that which comes from a direct experience, a direct spiritual experience within the heart, where the, the mind is, has a direct spiritual experience of that thing. It's only this third level that can be called Dhamma, that we can call absolute truth. Absolute truth cannot be reached through the other, the first two levels. Genuine realization only happens in this, on the third level. However, there is, the fact exists that it's possible to take the methods of vipassana and the understanding of Buddhism and talk about it as a philosophy. One can take vipassana and just treat it as philosophy. And it's quite enjoyable to do so. One can have a lot of fun philosophizing about Buddhism. And then it can go on and on. One enjoys it, but it, it doesn't ever come to an end. If one takes vipassana or Buddhism and turns it into a philosophy, it's, it's endless. And we can go on and on having our fun without ever getting anywhere. So if you ever come across anything called Buddhist philosophy, you should realize that that's not the real thing. It's not the essence of Buddhism. And so, therefore, 
We must walk. We should walk the path. And through walking that path, remove attachment from the five khandas. And then when we are removing this sense of I and mind from the five khandas, then we come to direct realization of this truth. This word path has great meaning, very important and special meaning. All life, all life is a kind of walking. All life is a kind of path. But because, because of ignorance, because life is so often ignorant, there is, we lose, we keep losing the real path. Life is always a, a walking, a traveling, but we often lose the path because of, because of ignorance. I'm, I'm talking about all kinds of life, not just human. There is always an evolution taking place in life, a development, a travel. But because there's ignorance, this, this traveling very, very seldom leads to the quenching of dukkha. Many, many living things don't, don't understand what's happening, and so they don't find the way to the quenching of dukkha. They don't know how to travel, how to walk correctly. I'm not, I'm not sure, because I'm not a native speaker of English, but it seems to me that the word path means the, the actual path or, or road that is traveled, whereas way means the method, the means of traveling, the method of traveling. So what I would ask you to consider carefully whether the, the Noble Eightfold Maga or the, the, middle, the middle way, which should we call this path or should we call it way? If there's no walking, no traveling, how, how could there ever be a path? If we don't walk, where is the path? If we're, we just sit still, there's, there's no path anywhere. In order for there to be a path, there must be the walking, the traveling, the practicing. From the beginning of, of life, all life forms have, have evolved. And in this evolution, there is, there is a path. There is a, a very clear, there are very clear paths and trails which evolution has followed. All life forms must, must evolve, must develop, and therefore there is always a traveling. It is necessary that all life will, will walk, will travel. And so there is then a, a path that has been traveled. And so when we're born from the mother's womb, we must walk, we must travel. But, be, but if we travel correctly, properly, there is no dukkha. But if we walk incorrectly, there will be dukkha. Now, when we're born, there is no knowledge and understanding of these things. And so, for the most part, we walk incorrectly. We walk incorrectly in, into dukkha. Because we are born ignorant, and because there are so many things around to entice us, to excite us, so many things that lead us to liking and disliking, that we are led in this way, and so we don't, we are unable to walk correctly. Now when there is no dukkha, when there is no dukkha at all, then one is walking correctly. 
one is is practicing properly. And so one can know from this whether the the walking is correct. When there's no dukkha, then then it is correct. But this can be deceiving. If one isn't careful, that that happiness one can attach to this this happiness. When there's no dukkha, that's a kind of happiness. But if we go and attach to it, then it's dukkha again. So the real path is to be above, beyond both dukkha and happiness. Otherwise, we keep falling into dukkha over and over again. The real path, the real walking, is above both happiness, sukha, and dukkha. So we must be very careful of the things gladness and sadness. In gladness, there is a lot of attachment to the five khandhas. In gladness, there's a whole bunch of grasping and clinging. So we must be very careful not to to get caught up in this this gladness and all the grasping and clinging of it, but to be above both gladness and sadness. Or sometimes we speak of good and evil, which are representative of all the dualities of every every dualism. And so we we walk to to lift ourselves above to put ourselves above all dualities, good and evil and every other pair of opposites. So we have a a way of, of walking that leads higher and higher until it is above good and evil, gladness and sadness, positive and negative and all the all the dualities. The mind is above them and therefore until it become it's becoming more and more free of the power and influence of these dualities until it is completely free. One an important something important about the path that should be understood is that the Buddha searched for and then discovered the path. The Buddha discovered this path and walked it completely. Then having discovered and found the path, the Buddha pointed it out to others. Now, the path itself is is just natural. The path was not created or made up by anyone. It's just existing in nature. And then the Buddha, after discovering it, pointed it out to others. This path, then, is, is the Dhamma. The Dhamma is the path that must be, be traveled. The Buddha discovered it and pointed it out. Then the path itself is the Dhamma. And the Sangha are those who have, who have followed the instructions and traveled the path until successful. Those who have traveled the path, who have practiced the Dhamma successfully, are called the Sangha. So the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, all three are very intimately related with the path and the traveling of the path. So we should we can see that coming to study about Buddhism means to come and study about walking the path, practicing the path. This is what it means to study study Buddhism. If we're going to walk the path, we have to know what it is and understand how to walk correctly. Otherwise, we just close our eyes and wander off, and it'll never be correct. And so we come to study the walking of the path 
so that we can walk correctly so that it will lead successfully to the quenching of dukkha. So it's important to study and understand how to walk the path. Or in, in certain teachings such as Taoism, in fact, Tao, Tao means path. Tao, the Tao is the path. And this is the path that is followed until one is free of the influence of yin and yang or positive, the positive and the negative. Through following the Tao, the path, one gets free of, of all dualism. So in, in other teachings as well, the path is, is central. So the word path has very special and important meaning. It's, it's the path that leads beyond the power of all negative and positive. So it's a very special thing. If we look in Christianity, we also find the path. The words, there are the words of Jesus Christ that I am the path or I am the way. Christ has said that he is the way to, to God. And what this means is that within, within Christ, within the way of living and behaving of Christ, there are the characteristics of selflessness, of, of living without self, of living not for self, of being willing to do anything for the sake of being free of self. So in Christ's life, we can see the path as well, the path that leads to, to God, to that which is beyond positive and negative. So, and this in fact is the heart of Christianity, this, this removal of the self, removing of the, of the I. This is the kind of understanding we'd, we'd like to, to make amongst the religions. That we can see that in each religion there is, there is the path. And we don't need to, to argue about it. We all just follow the path in our own way in order to be beyond the self, beyond all positive and all negative. So we encourage all Christians to see the symbol of the cross in the following way. The cross is shaped like this. The upright is the self, the I, the I, and then the cutting of the I, the cutting, the removal of the self. In the symbol of cross, there is this very clear reminder of the heart of all spiritual practice this removal of the eye. And so cutting, cutting away the self, this is the, the stairway to the highest thing, to God. Or there is the first commandment of God, that the order of God that forbid Adam and Eve to eat the fruit that led to the discrimination of good and evil and the attachment to that good and evil. If one doesn't discriminate good and evil, if one doesn't regard things as good and evil, there's no, there's no attachment to good and evil. And then one is free. So even here is the same teaching as Buddhism is in fact in God's first commandment there is the heart of Buddhism. Allow us to take a little time to to go off the subject for a minute. Across the highway we're building an international Dhamma hermitage and the purpose of this hermitage is in order to 
bring together representatives from all the religions in order to, to develop a mutual understanding that all, all true religion, all of the true religions have at their heart the path, that there is the path in each of these religions. And we, why, why bother arguing about which one is better or more attractive or more this or more that? but to understand and respect each other in terms of the, this path that exists in all religions, and then to help each other and support each other to, to follow this path. So we're trying to develop this in, an international Dhamma hermitage for this, this purpose, so that all religions can be most, most successful in, in following their own, following the path, the one path that is at the heart of every religion. And to stop worrying about the secondary and superficial issues. So all religions teach the path. Buddhism, in Christianity, it's taught that Jesus Christ is the way, is the path. In Buddhism, the Dhamma is, is the path. In Taoism, the Tao, the Tao, is the path. All religions have the path. All religions teach the path to the highest thing. All religions teach the path to the goal, which is beyond all, all suffering to live without any dukkha, without any conflict in strife, to live, to live in, in true peace, in perfect peace. This is the heart of every religion. And so we, it's possible that all the religions can get together and cooperate. It's utterly foolish to argue and compete. Instead, we, we should understand each other and see this path that is the center of all religion and then cooperate. And so, this is enough for an introduction about the path. And now we'll talk about the path directly. The, the path in Buddhism is called the Arya Atankika Maga, which means the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Path with, with eight components or eight factors. The details of the Noble Eightfold Path are not something that we have to talk about right here. There are, there are plenty of books about Buddhism that adequately explain the various factors, the various components of the Noble Eightfold Path. So we don't have to use time to talk about them. They are, they are simply right view, right aspiration, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. As for the details of these various, these eight various factors, one can find these in the very, in the many books that, that deal with the subject. There's not anything very tricky or complicated about these eight factors. But what we would like to, to give special attention to is the word right. All of these are right, right view, right aspiration, and so on. And it's very important that we understand correctly what right means. In, in Pali, the word samma means right, or in Thai they use the word chob. And chob has a, a sense of being just, of being correct. So they, when we use the word right, this means most of all, that it is correct. It's, it's correct. 
if we use the word right, then it, it must have some reference. So right according to what? Right in terms of what? This is very important. What is the object? Or what is the reference of this, this rightness? Buddhism, if it is right, it must be right in terms of Nibbana. The reference point of this correctness in Buddhism is, is Nibbana. It must lead right to Nibbana. In Christianity, it must be right towards God, the supreme thing. Or for us here, it's, it's enough to say right regarding new life, right towards right, new life. Right. <laughs> this is enough for us. Because we've, we've already discussed that new life means life that is beyond positive and negative. So it's, it's plenty, it's enough just to have to be right to the new life. In the Pali, it is explained clearly that the meaning of sama is to be right in terms of its goal. It's right if it truly successfully leads to its, the goal. So that means that right view is right if it's pointing to, leading to the goal, the goal of Nibbana, or whatever we'd like to call it. And then right aspiration, right aim, is right if it's truly pointing to, aiming at, leading to the goal. And the same for right speech, right action, right livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and right concentration. There are four words that explain, explain sama, sama quite clearly. The meaning of these four words is very important. The first is viveka or viveka. Viveka means to be supremely single or supreme singularity, utmost singleness. Eka means one or single and we means supreme or the highest or perfect. So this means to be perfectly independent. It's perfect freedom. To be completely one. To be completely one is the me And so the path or sama is to depend on this viveka, to lead to this viveka. The second word is viraka, viraka, which means, and the path, the path is leading to viraka or fading away. If we use the word viraka in terms of physical things, it's, it would be the stains, the dyes in a piece of cloth fading away, fading away, becoming fainter and fainter until completely gone. If we use it in terms of the mind, it means the fading away of, of attachment. As attachment dissolves, breaks up and fades away, fades away. This is viraka until the, the complete fading away of attachment. This is the second word used to describe the path. The third word is the word niroda, which we talked quite a bit about yesterday. Niroda is the, the path leads to the quenching down. The path is the quenching down, the quenching down of, of dukkha. And the fourth may sound, be a little bit difficult to hear and understand, but is Wosaka, Wosaka is the fourth of these words, 
Vosaka Parinami, always inclining towards, always tending towards, always tending towards throwing away, always tending towards throwing away our burdens. The burdens, of course, are anything, are any attachment to any of the five pandas. The attachments are the burdens. Wosaka is throwing away those, the burdens of attachment. And so, Wosaka Parinami is, the mind is always tending towards, inclining towards the throwing away of attachment. For it to be the path, for something to truly be the path, there must be this constant throwing away. The mind is constantly inclining towards getting rid of attachments, getting, relieving itself of the burden of attachment. Nowadays in this world, our tendency isn't to, to throw away, to get rid of. Our tendency is always to accumulate, to get more. And so it's, it's not wosaka harinami. Parinami. It's, it's the opposite of that. And so nowadays the world is cluttered. It's full of all kinds of, of junk that we don't even need. And so there's not a whole lot of Wosaka Parinami. And so <clears throat> there are these four words to explain what we mean by right. We wake up this perfect singleness, which means true spiritual independence, perfect, perfect freedom. Then viraka, that fading away, meaning that the mind is, is not making more attachment and more dukkha. It's going towards the, the fading away of dukkha. And then nirota, the quenching and the coolness. And then wotsaka, always tending towards throwing away, getting rid of all those burdens, lightening, lightening the load. So these four then are the basic principles of, of rightness, of correctness. But nowadays in the world, nobody's really interested in this. And so, all the things we do are going in the opposite direction. Take giving charity, giving dana, giving charity. It's usually done not, not for giving up, not for throwing away, but to receive certain benefits. People give charity in order to be reborn in heaven. Or, or now big companies give charity as a way of getting advertisement or to enhance their image. Or then keeping morality, behaving decently and peacefully. This isn't done for wiraka, wiweka. It's done for to build up one's pride, to build up one's reputation, to to, and politicians often cultivate this image for, for various worldly benefits. This isn't really right, at least in spiritual terms. On the worldly level, it may be right. That may be correct for the way things work in the world. But in terms of ending dukkha, it's not, it's not correct. Or even even developing the mind, practicing samadhi, meditation, is very often not for viveka, viraka, nirota, or vosaka, barinami. Meditation is often done with all kinds of trying to get magic powers or being able to read people's minds or to become famous or to go back to the West and be a meditation teacher, and all kinds of things are taken 
as the goal of meditation. And so, if we don't have these qualities, these four qualities, then even what superficially may seem to be a spiritual practice is, is no longer spiritual. It's, it's dragged, it's just turned into another worldly activity. Some people do vipassana for, to see all kinds of, of things. Vipassana means to see clearly. And some people do vipassana in order to clearly see where dead people have gone and been reborn, or to see what heaven looks like, or see what hell looks like, or even to see what the next lottery number, the next winning lottery number will be. These, of course, none of these have anything to do with viveka, viraka, nirota and vosaka barinami. So when we took, but to, for real vipassana, real vipassana must have these four qualities. If it's lacking these qualities, it's just some fake play, superficial, worldly show of vipassana. So we must be very careful that everything we do, all our our spiritual work has these four qualities. And so giving, giving away charity, helping the poor, and doing good deeds, these are generally done for benefits of, in this world, for worldly benefits such as a good reputation, a happy mind, for to feel good about oneself or to respect oneself and things like this or sometimes to to impress other people or to who knows what to become famous this is correct in worldly terms as far as way things work in this world that's correct but it's not correct in terms of being above the world. That kind of attitude and understanding doesn't lead beyond the world. It doesn't free us from worldly conditions. For it to be correct in terms of transcending the world, being above and free of the world, these four qualities are necessary. This means that it is, must be correct in terms of Nibbana. So, sama, rightness, correctness, has this, must be correct in terms of Nibbana. And if so, it has these four, these four characteristics. Look carefully, and you'll see that worldly correctness, what is right according to the world, always leads to being stuck in the world. Worldly ideas about what is correct and right always leads to getting stuck and trapped within worldly conditions. But right, in terms of being beyond the world's power, in terms of Nibbana, in terms of true freedom and peace, has these four qualities of perfect singleness, fading away, quenching and always inclining towards the throwing away of burdens. Now we come to the word atankika. Atankika, ata means eight, ika means factor, component, part, or ingredient. It's usually translated the eightfold, eightfold. We don't really know what this word fold means, but maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong. But the, the meaning of the Pali is eight factors, eight components, or eight ingredients which come together to form one unity. It's not eight separate paths or eight parallel paths. It's eight ingredients 
that come together to form one unity. We can compare it to a rope with eight strands or an eight ply rope where there are three little strings woven together to form one strong rope. Any of the little strings by themselves couldn't do very much, but tie them, weave them together, and we've got one strong rope that's sufficient to do the job. Now, <clears throat> although it's, it's one, the eight factors must fit together in a unified whole, there is one factor which is the leader, which is, which is like the main ingredient. It's like in a medicine, especially in herbal medicine, where you mix various things together. There will be one that is the primary ingredient. So in the Noble Eightfold Path, there is one factor which is like this. And this factor is sama, samadhi, or right concentration. Now this may sound a little bit strange to some of you. Many people would think that it's right understanding, right view, sama dt, the first factor, which is most important, which must be the leader. But the way it really works is that in the path, it's sama samadhi, that is, that is the lead leader, the main factor in doing doing the work. But what's important here is that it's sama samadhi. It's not just concentration, but it's got to be right concentration. And it's right concentration if it's if that right in concentration includes right view. If there's no right view, the concentration can never be right. So for the, the concentration to be right, it's it's being backed up by right, right understanding. And so what, the way it works is that, or we've got then a special word or a new word to, to describe this. Some places the Buddha called it Arya Sama Samati, noble right concentration or enemyless right concentration. And this noble right concentration has seven supporters. The noble right concentration is doing the work, but it's backed up by the other seven factors. Concentration by itself couldn't really do much. It couldn't solve any problems. But if right concentration is backed up by the other seven factors, then it is capable of cutting through all our problems and solving, solving the, the dilemma of, of dukkha. So it's this noble right concentration which is the, the leader of the path, but it's still backed up, supported by the other seven. At first, it, it seems strange that right, that wisdom, right understanding and right aspiration aren't, aren't leading the, the way, that they've now just, they've become helpers and supporters of this, this noble right concentration. It, we talk so much about wisdom that it sounds a little funny that they're they're in a support role here. But without that the real power and the real strength of the path is with that right concentration and the, the other things support it. If we were to talk about wisdom cutting through the defilements, wisdom penetrating to, to truth, we, it's only the wisdom that has this, this noble right concentration. Without that right samadhi, wisdom can't really function. So, 
At first, when when we found this in the Pali, we we didn't believe it. It didn't make sense to us. How could how could concentration be the leader with right understanding and right aspiration as as backups or supports? It didn't make much sense to us, but it's written there in the scriptures, and so we we studied it and tried to check out whether it was true or not. And so there's noble right concentration, not just right concentration, but noble, the right concentration that gets free of all enemies. And this is supported by wisdom, right, con- right understanding, and right aspiration, as well as all the other rightnesses of the path. It would be like having something very sharp that has no weight. It couldn't cut. It couldn't cut through anything. Take a razor blade, which is very sharp, but it doesn't have the weight to cut through anything thick like a tree. And unfortunately, our defilements are, are rather thick. So just having the sharpness, the wisdom, the understanding isn't enough. There's got to be the weight of samadhi with it. And so to, to do the work of removing the attachments, it takes, it takes right view, it takes right aspiration, it takes right morality, it takes enough right energy, enough mindfulness. But there's got to be that, that strength, that, that focus, that samadhi of the mind to actually do it. So right samadhi must be accompanied by all the other factors in order to cut through attachment, to remove attachment. We, we tend to have a lot more interest in sharpness than in weight. We give, we respect and honor sharpness more than weight. Meaning we, we, in society, for example, the ones that are given the higher status are the, the intellectuals much more than the, the workers. But in cutting through a tat, well, in, but in this, in the Pali, the, when it comes to really doing the work, the one that's given the emphasis, giving the, the number one place, is right samadhi. Because in cutting through attachment, it's samadhi that does the work. Wisdom guides, may guide things, and the wisdom has, has to be there. But what actually does the work is the factor of right concentration. When, when cons- and this, there's another name for this kind of concentration, it's called Anantariya Samadhi. Anantariya means to be, it means immediate in the sense that wisdom is right there with the Samadhi. It's Samadhi that is, is stuck together, which is fused. It's samadhi that is fused together with wisdom. And when that wisdom is right there with that samadhi, then it can do the work of cutting through the defilements. Literally, anantariya means without gap. There's no space. There's not the least bit of space between wisdom and samadhi. And so, sharpness and weight cannot be separated. If you take them, these two qualities a- apart, you, you don't get any work done. So we must combine the sharpness and the weight in order to cut through the attachments, to chop through the, the defilements. And it's also necessary for there to be sila. Sila is living life in a good, proper way, a peaceful way of life, or 
a normal way of life. Sila means normal. It's often translated ethics. So having an ethical, decent, good life is like a foundation. To do the cutting, to use the sharpness in the way, to cut through the defilements, we need something to stand on. And that, that firm foundation we stand on is sila. For, to, for it to be the Noble Eightfold Path, for it to truly be the path, there must be the weight and the sharpness working intimately together with no separation. And then the foundation of sila must be there as well. We can't just get by with wisdom, with intelligence. There must be the, the ethical life and the, the weight of samadhi. Or we, or we can't get by on just one of these. We must have all three of these key ingredients working together. And so within the Eightfold Path, there is the correctness or even the perfection of, of ethical living. There is the perfection of, of, of mental strength and skill, of samadhi, and there is the perfection of wisdom. These three correctnesses are functioning together in an inseparable way in the Noble Eightfold Path. As for the details of each of these eight factors, it's not difficult to find information on them in many of the books that have been published, even the ones that have been written by Western scholars. You can get sufficient information on these. But the, the key ingredient, what's really important, is to understand how these work together. The, these factors are often considered separately and nobody bothers to put them together. So the question is, how do they work together? How do they come together into one path? And then what is the way, how does that path cut through attachment? How does that path remove the attachment? This is what must be understood. And so it is that the fourth noble truth answers the question, by what method? This fourth noble truth explains the method. And within this fourth noble truth, we have the summary or the completion and integration of all the other noble truths. The fourth noble truth is the path that leads to the quenching of dukkha. So the, re the result of this path, the fruits of the path, are the third noble truth, the quenching of all dukkha. And the way that this is done is by removing the cause of dukkha, removing the source of dukkha, removing which is the second noble truth. And then the problem we started with in the beginning the problem of dukkha is gone. And so in the fourth noble truth, all the noble truths are completed. And so in summary, the noble eightfold path is the path of life, but it must be a path of new life, the path of new life that is completely beyond all problems. This, this is what the eightfold path is about. And so we finished we finished today's discussion and our meeting today is is complete. And so we close we close the school for today. <laughs>